You can circle your project, daydreaming about a time when it's finished. Or you can take decisive action, get stuck in and make it happen. How did this happen? Well, let's get straight into it. We've got a few things that are anchored to the chassis through the body that have to come out and a handful of bolts around the car mounting the body to the chassis. So there are a few either side of the transmission tunnel. There are three in the back of the car just aft of the engine running across the floor. These bolt to the aftmost section of the chassis and in the front there are two again bolting through the floor to the foremost section of the body. In both these cases, fore and aft, getting to these bolts is difficult. And I wasn't in the humor. So on the front ones, I just cut the heads off. These are bolts I'm going to replace anyway. I had already done one way back before we even moved out of the original unit. So with the heads knocked off them, I was able to just drift them through the floor. We are now looking underneath the car in the top of this picture, you're looking at the chassis backbone and in the bottom is the fiberglass of the body itself. And this is one of the through body bolts that has to come out. And you can see it's a nylock nut. Everything is in decent nick here. These bolts came out without any problem at all. But do you remember this? Way back from episode five, this is the seatbelt mount. It's not actually a body mount and it was completely seized. I cut the seatbelt off it because the seatbelt receiver was broken anyway. So this is round two and I went in with some penetrating fluid and a small amount of heat because I didn't want to start burning the fiberglass. But no dice, so I kept moving. On the offside, you can see here the through body bolt and behind it, the driver's seat belt mounting point, which is in much better nick. This is recessed though and I found that on the passenger side it's not, it's quite proud. I'm not sure what's going on here. It might be a design thing. It might be an inconsistency of manufacturer, who knows? We will investigate that as we move along. Now this is one of the rearmost bolts in the boot floor. It's specifically that one there. And with a spanner underneath the car, these all came out without any problem at all. So we're having a grand time of things. Seized bolts haven't been an issue so far, save for that one seat belt. Now I'd missed a couple of bolts right in the front of the footwell of the car, one on each side. And these were buried underneath, through all of the suspension linkage, brake lines and whatnot. These things were fairly inaccessible and looked very seized. But I managed to get a wire brush onto them, a little bit of penetrating fluid, and they turned out to look a whole lot worse than they were. I had no problem taking these out. So now we're just left with that seized seat belt mount, which I was worried was going to foul the body when we tried to lift it off. So I got a scrap of metal and formed it into a shield for this so that I could get some proper heat onto it. But even then, I just felt like I was gonna start a fire. So I never truly got this to glow cherry red. And I went with the old weld on a bolt and let's try and get it off that way. But foiled by my own shoddy merchandise. You probably noticed that I cut a groove into the remains of the original seized bolt to try and get an impact driver onto it, which just didn't happen. And now that I'm trying to weld something to it, that slot that I've cut has weakened it and ripped off with our weld. We got to keep moving and we'll just try and get the body to clear this when we get that far. In the cabin, the throttle cable, some of the heater controls and the speedo drive are still running through. So we've got to pull those back out. They literally run through the rear bulkhead and into the engine bay. Nothing complex about this at all. Initially, I was going to pull this small bracket here off, drill out the two rivets. Then I realized I didn't need to. And our snaky cable slithered back through the bulkhead. Say that three times fast. The inlet and return for the heater. Back through the bulkhead, Japs. And lastly, right in the front of the car, 
the clutch cable, a vacuum pipe for the brake servo and two brake lines. Now underneath the car, the unions on these brake lines fought me all the way and I got the blowtorch out to get some heat onto them again. And I wanna show you something here because in the background out of my line of sight, there was a piece of foam and because it was so dry, it was like tinder just smoldering away in the background. Yeah, what tinder are you thinking about? <clears throat> anyway, it could have gone up. It didn't as it turned out, but it could have and I didn't know it was happening. So be careful with that kind of thing. Save for that, these lines came out without much trouble. And the last things that were left were the few lines with their banjo fittings, one each side of the car. One go bye-bye, two go bye-bye. At this point, I was very excited because the time had come to pull the body off the car. Now I set up three camera angles to capture this action. This one you're looking through, the one I'm up the ladder setting up to capture it from on high, and this third angle from the corner. Guess how many of them captured this special moment in the car build? Just the one. Now there were seven of us, and with seven, not one of us felt any kind of weight here at all. I reckon you could do this with four people, but I think the more the merrier and the better for the car because you don't want any one area of the car getting too much pressure put on it. Now the guys at Delta, they didn't think much of this chassis design. They thought it was kind of agricultural, but you know, backbone chassis, I think are very cool things. And you might think, well, where's the side impact? Well, Lotus cars even earlier than this one in the mid 70s were winning awards even over Volvo for safety. Their crash impact was incredible. By comparison to modern composite cars, these Lotus fiberglass bodies are way thicker. They make cars like the Elise seem like it's made of paper. Anyway, it does sound like I protest too much. I love this thing and couldn't care less what anybody else thinks of it because I think there's beautiful geometry in this chassis. And the little boy trapped inside this man's body just sees a radio controlled car with the shell taken off it. But let's have a quick look at some of the setup here. Up front, very simple. You've got your coolant tubes running through the chassis. You've got your wishbones and radiator and fan set up. To the rear, you've got these trailing arms, this Citroen Maserati gearbox, and this is the distributor. And it's sitting pride of place below the carburetors, which is why when these cars fell into the hands of dreamers, guys who couldn't afford them when they were new, the type of people who didn't worry about servicing, and you have to remember that, you know, 160 horsepower from a two liter engine in 1976 was quite a lot back then. This was a highly tuned engine and demanded maintenance. The carbs would start leaking when they hadn't been serviced and neat fuel would rain down on the distributor. And that, my friends, is how many Esprits met their end. So let's leave that for now and have a look at a slick twin cam inline four. If you think of Alpha's Bialboro engine, Lotus's earlier twin cam working of the Ford Kent, or the Toyota T and R series engines, they're all pretty engines and all look kind of similar. Of course, all being double overhead cam, they're bound to. But then look at the Fiat Lampredi twin cam, like in Sid's Mirror Fury in episode four. Lampredi is the name of its designer, who was formerly Ferrari. It's an engine that manages to stand out with its distinctive angled cam covers. And I think the 907 engine from the Esprit has something of its own going on too. I think this was given some really cool understated looks. And it's canted over at 45 degrees. And part of the reason for that, I mean, obviously it keeps the weight lower, it allows the lines of the car to be lower, but also this was intended to be one half of the Lotus 909 V8 engine. And the only one that I'm aware of still in existence is in the Lotus Etna concept car, another Jujaro design. I think it's privately owned. And what a beautiful engine. Such a pity you can't get your hands on these. The Esprit was supposed to be a two model deal a four pot and a V8. And I think these early cam covers are just glorious. Anyway, enough of the jibber jabber. There were actually two more little bits and pieces that I'd overlooked before the body came off. The first was the coil. That was no big swing, just two bolts onto the body. But the second I was worried was gonna give me trouble because it's known to, and that was the universal joint for the steering column running through the body to the steering rack. Now this looked very greasy and quite free, but I wasn't taking any chances. And downstairs I found the guys 
big ass slide hammer. Now, I don't have one of these and I've never used one, but it is my new favorite tool. And I made a concoction of bits and pieces from their slide hammer kit, a chain, this kind of clamp deal, a nut and bolt or two. And this is the rig that I devised to pull this UJ out of the car. You see, I've got a nut and bolt running through the universal joint itself and clamped in this clamp. And I gave one test whack sitting in the passenger compartment and then I gave it one for real. And I had a very abrupt and unexpected meeting with the rear bulkhead of the car. The UJ flew out. And now, even though I couldn't even guess what the next job I'd ever need a slide hammer for would be, I want one, my new favorite. So this is that Citroen Maserati transaxle I was telling you about. This came out of a Citroen SM. It's a decent transaxle. I'm not sure it's rated for much more power than a Lotus can give it, but it's certainly strong enough. And coming from it, the inboard brakes, the pinnacle of F1 design at the time. And again, the Chapman strut, where your drive shaft is your top link. You see here, you've got a trailing arm and the drive shaft creating what would be almost an upper wishbone. You've got a lower link and the coilover unit with the shock. And here's that geometry I was talking about. Look at these triangulated sections of the chassis and one axis and then that suspension geometry triangulating again from another axis. I just think it's really, really cool. And by the way, because of that setup with the Chapman strut with the drive shaft also carrying the burden of the suspension, it eats the universal joints in the drive shaft. And as Ian Harbin said, wheel bearings get a fair hammering too, but I'm not sure that's directly related. That's just related to the amount of cornering force that this car can handle. Now I just thought I'd show you this exhaust manifold because you can see Hadley must have painted it just before he put the car away because it hasn't even had a chance to burn the paint off. This is an area where I'm hoping to lose some weight. This is a big heavy cast manifold and we're going to replace it with something tubular. Further down the system, the Series 2 Esprit got a mid silencer the Series 1 didn't have. This is an aftermarket exhaust, a bespoke stainless job, following roughly the same layout as the original. And up the front, this whole suspension setup is Opel Ascona, if you can believe that. Save for having its mounting points, the geometry of how it's set up changed by the people at Lotus. And it just goes to show how adaptable suspension can be in different applications. And that fine sir is how you pull the body from a Lotus Esprit after months of stripping and torture with units and forklift trucks and forklift trucks i think a pat on the back's in order cheers oh i love this shot looks 3d oh trippy next time we will work towards a bare chassis I'm not hanging around this time. We've got to keep it punchy. To my new patrons, Gavin Gregory, Ruth and Adam Davies, and Sergio Ferreira, and to all Soup's patrons, thank you for keeping this going and making it happen. I will be back the next time with some very cool stuff that's going on. Until then, do get stuck in, and good luck. <laughs>